Hi, this is Peter Onorati. We're on Game Changers with Vicki Abelson. You do that so well. I was just telling Peter, he just did the best PSA we've had. Pete, can you hand me that half for a second? We do these PSAs for, Risk, for Rick Smokey, and um, Peter just did the best one for the veterans, so I'm excited about that. Peter, hi! Hi. Thank you for uh, doing this. What? This took like months and months and months. I know, I know, it's crazy. You know, that's what we do out here. We just run around until something you you know, work. happens. Yeah. You work, well, so work yeah. is a good thing. I gotta pay off my kids' college. <laughs> I'm about to start doing that. Yikes! Um, Susie Soro, thank you. Thanks, Suze. Still got your picture up in the living room. Do you really? Yeah. All right, well, I'm gonna be able to prove that to you. I'm gonna take a picture of it and send it to you. So tell me about, okay, so we were starting to talk about it before. Tell me how you know Susie Soro, who is a comedian. What, what, where did you... Uh... So when I was uh, at uh, McCall's Magazines... Um... Okay, that's a real... Okay, <laughs> we, we, you know what? We got to go back. Okay. okay, so you're a little kid. You're in Jersey. Yeah. What do you want to be when you grow up? Football player. And you were. Okay, uh, so... Yeah. Okay, so... Yeah, I went to a small college, played football there, then had a tryout for the World Football League. Made it to the last cut and then had to figure out something else. Okay. Uh, and, but you were also a wrestler, right? I was a wrestler, yeah. yeah. I was a wrestler in high school. I was supposed to wrestle at college, but I didn't want to lose weight anymore. My senior year in high school, I played football at 160 and I wrestled 136. What? Yeah. 136? Yeah, that was like discipline on steroids. <laughs> Why would you have to be so thin? Well, back in those days, we thought, you know, if you got all your fat weight off, that you would be just all muscle and you'd be the strongest kid in your weight class. We didn't realize that fat was energy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we used to do some terrible things to ourselves. Um, and speaking of being a wrestler, that was some hot wrestling you did on Sex in the City. It's such a hard job. <laughs> Having to do it with Kim Cattrall, yeah, you well, poor thing. The executive producer called me and said, hey, you want to do five sex scenes with Kim Cattrall? I said, no, i got to wash my hair. <laughs> so, I know Michael Patrick Kim. You know Michael. Yes. Yeah. Well, Michael was at my wedding. I've known oh. Michael that long. So uh, I flew out there, and um, I had only done two other scenes where there was that amount of nudity and that I had to deal with. So... Um, Not that you ever have to worry about that. Uh, you know what? You never look as good as you want to look. You know? Well. So I created this disclaimer that I I, I gave to uh, Kim, um, and I said, "Listen, uh, I'd like to apologize ahead of time for the presence or the lack of a situation here, <laughs> of a response, because I'm no hero and you're not ugly, you know." And she said. That's the first time I've ever heard something like that. So what she used to do is she had a cup fashioned for her leading men that was like a sort of a pliable bra cup. It was on clear strings, so, you know, your ass is hanging out. Yeah. But in the front was this, this cup. And so there was one point where... Because she had a you know, lot of those. She did. That's all she did, you know. So we're going at yeah. it at one point, and uh, the cup sort of pops in and pops out. She goes... I said, that was the cup. That wasn't me. That was the cup. She goes, well, maybe I liked it. I said, well, I hope you did because we got four hours more of this shit. So, you know, uh, but she was great and, and, and wonderful. And that was actually my birthday. She said to me, right before we got done, we had one more scene issue. Mm -hmm. And she said, ah, I want to thank you for doing this. She goes, I, you know, I, I love it when they get actors here, I, you know, and not somebody just off the street that can't. Get. I said, Kim? It's my birthday, and I can't think of anything better than to bang you five times. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So in the meantime, when I, went, I finished the last scene, mm -hmm. I went back to the dressing room, put my clothes on. <laughs> she had sent out for, for a Carvel birthday cake for me. Oh, Carvel. And I was Aww. staying in the city, so I brought it in the city, and we had uh, dinner with my cousins that showed up. and. That's very birthday. sweet. Yeah. Nothing's better than Carvel. No. Nothing. Ask We're Tom New Carvel. Yorkers. Well, well, Tom. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Tom Carvel. The whale. What was that yeah, whale? Fudgy the whale. Okay. Fudgy yeah, the yeah. whale. Yeah. There, so, so I'm just telling you who's saying hello to you. Um, Joe Friday. See your friend. Joe Friday. Um, Joey Novick. I know Joey. Joey. Joe, yeah. We, hi, Joey. I got started in improv through Joey. Through Joey? Joey gave a one night stand class in comedy. Now, my old girlfriend, who was working at McCall's at the time, when I was still at Ford Motor Company... Oh, my God. We have so much to talk about, okay. but tell this story. So, she and I, I used to come in to... Uh, Ford was in Newark, and I used to come in and see her 
you know, every on, on Fridays, mm -hmm. and uh, we would go to uh, the improv when, when Seinfeld was headlining and Mark Wiener and all those guys. Mm -hmm. And we'd ride back on the bus to New Jersey, and I'd say, you know, I think I could do that. She got so sick and tired. How, how old were you? About. I was 27. Oh, so you didn't come to this profession so young. You, oh, no, no, no. I, okay. I didn't get into acting until I was 33. Okay. So I was 27, so mm -hmm. we were riding back. She got so sick and tired of hearing me say that. <laughs> That she bought me a one night stand class in comedy from the Network for Learning. If you remember them in New York, they used the to teach everything all over the city. They had these little classes from everything from how to take care of your feet to stand up comedy. <laughs> well, Joey Novick was giving <laughs> this take class. Care of your feet. And um, I'm trying to get us on here. So and I took it, comments. and yeah. it was one night thing. And uh, they said, uh, Oh, you should do this. I go, I'm not going to do it. So this is your first comedy class? This is the first anything? Yeah, yeah. Did you do plays in high school? No. You did You did nothing? No, I did nothing. Did you have singing lessons? No. Oh, wait a minute. We're going to get to this with the pop rock thing. <laughs> you did not have singing lessons? No, no, no. Oh, my God. No. All right. So the people, anyway, that were in that first class with Joey mm -hmm. ended up down the road creating an improv group that I later joined when I left Ford Motor Company and went into McCall's. I was in the city all the time, so I worked out with them, and that's where I met my wife. Joe? Aww. In the improv group. And where did wh where did the improv group work out of? Uh, the West Beth Arts Complex, okay. uh, the No Smoking Playhouse on 46th Street, this comedy, uh, 78th Street Theater Lab, uh, all the hole in the walls. And is there anybody else from that company that went on to greatness? Well, everybody went on to greatness, but not in the business. Not in the business. Yeah, okay. I mean, but that was a group of people who none of them were in the business. I was the director of marketing and research for McCall's Magazines. One woman was the art director for Fortune Magazine, or oh. Forbes. And uh, one woman was in uh, 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 Rockefeller Foundation. Another guy was at Cancer Research at Sloan Kettering. And then my friend, who became the Kippermans with me, ran his father's ball bearing distributorship out of Queens. Is there any way that Pete can grab that can grab picture it. of the... Sure. Do you know where it is, Pete? Where is it? It's right there on the wall, right inside. Um, there. I'm sorry to Bantry. make you run, but I'm just thinking. Next, right around the corner. You know what? Pete. We also should have done. We right should have there. put the camera at that end so that yeah. we, it would be looking this way. That's I didn't right. think of that. That's all right. Is that the three of you? That one? Yes. 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 The Kippermans. You guys have to see the Kippermans because, and yeah. you have to tell the story of the Kippermans. Um, so that's so you met Joey Novick and you met your wife. So what was your wife doing when she came into the class? She was an, an actress in New York. And uh, okay, so wait, I'm going to hold this up. They can see it. Okay, so Uncle Floyd. For those of you who um, are Jersey fans, you can see it good yep. here. Okay, so now tell us the story. So Gary Richmond, my partner, and I, um, we, I was still at McCall's, and our group had won um, the New York version of the Improv Olympics. So okay, wait, we don't want that happening. We don't want that noise. Okay. Especially, I don't want to hear myself. Jeez. <laughs> so, um, we went to Chicago to compete at Second City. What was the name of your... Port Authority Theater Ensemble. Okay. Because we all came from different places around New York. Or <laughs> we called ourselves Pate. <laughs> <laughs> so, Port Authority Theater Ensemble, Pate. Pate. I like it. <laughs> so, we were at... Uh, uh, Gary and I... Gary had always done this great old Jewish character in all our improvs, and I loved it. And... Uh, so we were standing in the wings, getting ready to go on to a doctor's office sketch. And I said, hey, just grab me around the waist. And let's grab, let's go in as Siamese twins. So we went in <laughs> and we did these old Hasidic Siamese twins that played the guitar. And so how did the, what did the old Hasidic, do you remember anything from it? Is from it, the Kippermans? Yeah. Oh yeah, we, we did. Every, we, we, we would end up in a slap fight trying to push each other away. <laughs> um, we did a lot of, we did a lot of parodies. We did... Um, you know those old uh, in, invisible dog leashes that, you know, just yeah, a Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. so we, and, it, and it was it looked like it was right, taut. Right, Yeah, yeah. So I taped two of them together so that it had two heads. <laughs> and we would stand up in the comedy clubs and we'd go, we're looking for a dog. Have you seen him? His name is Spots. <laughs> and, and Gary would say, let's do the song. So we wrote a song. So And I did the strumming. He played guitar. I did the strumming. And we did, on the rug again. <laughs> that stupid spot's made on the rug again. And we went on from there. And we had, we had a bunch of songs. That's this kind of stuff that we did on the Uncle Floyd show, too. Oh, know? my God. Uncle Floyd. And we always got, we always got, um, people would come up to us. There was a woman in the city at the time who had a, a um, um, Adrian Gussoff was her name. Mm -hmm. She had a service called Bubby Graham. And she would go, 
you know, candy grams, but she would go into somebody's office and act like a yeah, Bobby, Bobby slap a in the head with a Bobby is your grandmother if right. you're, yeah, okay. Slap in the head with rubber chicken and leave them chicken soup, you know? <laughs> so she hired us to do oh, that nice. in our time off. So we did. We would do events. We did stuff in the garment district. We did people's retirement parties. We wrote songs for them and everything. And inevitably, every time I came off the stage, somebody would come up to me and go, "You're Jewish, aren't you?" I said, "No, I'm not." Yes, you are. You're Jewish. I said, "No, I'm Italian. I'm Catholic." Same thing, you know. And I said, "Well, not really the same thing for me." With Jews and, 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 and Catholics and, and, and Italians, basically. Right. Um, there's common ground. Did you grow up in a neighborhood that, because I grew up in the Bronx, which was Jewish and Italian. Did well, you? my family, some of my family's from the Bronx. Yeah, from Westchester Avenue, Westchester Square, that whole area. Okay. My grandpa, Danny. Um, but in your, where you grew up, where in Jersey? In Jersey, you? Boonton, New Jersey. And so was that all Italian or? No, Italian, Polish, Irish. It was an industrial town. Okay. But there was a lot of Italians. I mean, was it was it working class? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was amazing. New work. It was nothing but working class. And you, what did your father do? He was a stonemason, and he started a little construction company with my uncle after his father died, my grandfather. But he did well because he was building houses. Built houses. Did a lot of, of of paving. He ended up going into the paving business, which um, so the company still does. So did he put a couple does. people underneath the sidewalk? Well, maybe you know, with there's the There's some thing. sinkholes. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know what's under there. You know. Anybody connected in your family? No, not that I know okay. of. I mean, there were guys that came around to talk to my father, and my father said, "Look, I'm a little guy. What do you want from me?" Did you they know? leave him alone? Yeah. Really? Well, one of the reasons they left him alone is because I I won't mention the name, but the mm -hmm. next town over was another uh, contractor and uh, a property acquisition <laughs> sort of person. And he hired my father, subcontracted a lot of stuff out to my father, and he was connected. Every Christmas on Mulberry Street at uh, Benito's 2, he would have a dinner for all his subs. And, <laughs> Benito's 2, and, that's a good restaurant. Yeah. And I think, he, uh, I think he just said, you know, leave this guy alone. You know. That was lucky for your father. Yeah, although I did spend most of my time in New York while I was working at McCall's or any other place convincing people that you could be Italian, and not your father in construction, <laughs> and, not, and from New Jersey, and not be connected. That's you very know? unusual, yeah. because anybody who watched The Sopranos, all of those things exist. Those were all the things. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, uh, David Chase spent a lot of time. I, I heard he grew up in Mountain Lakes, which is right next to me. That was the rich kids' uh, uh community and because uh, they were all connected yeah yeah and, and the places that he used he used Boonton my hometown for oh, a few really? things but the guys I think he was talking about were uh the Boyardos from Livingston the Boyardos I used to oh the Boyardos were the Sopranos yes the real oh family, I see I never heard about this I think the real family was the Boyardos I don't know that anybody come even, after me if I, I'm wrong I've never even heard of the Boyardos yeah yeah and uh I used to caddy once in a while um at the Knoll Country Club, which is right on the border of Parsippany and, and Boonton. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of those guys really? come through there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It was, it was a great old golf course, and, you know, everybody was uh, having fun. Got good tips? Yeah. They, I bet they tipped yeah, well. Yeah, they were good. They okay, were so, let, so let's roll it back again. So, okay. so you're a little kid. You, you want to be a, you, you're a sports person. Right. You do the whole football thing. You're not in school plays. Right. Okay, you get... Uh, so you end up going to college, not, you get an MBA from... Well, I got my, my bachelor's in business from Lycoming College. I mm -hmm. uh, played football there, and then I went to try out for the World Football League. I made it to the last cut. I got cut, and then I ended up playing semi-pro in the New Jersey area, which was a big mistake. Did you get hurt? I mean, you don't look like no. you're all broken and I broke everything. my nose a little bit, but not, not much. But mm -hmm. then um, I went back to Fairleigh Dickinson University to mm -hmm. get my MBA. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime... Were you a good student all along? No, I was a terrible student. I, 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 the first time I ever went to school because I wanted to mm -hmm. was for my MBA. Wow. And I did well in my MBA. I had the highest grade point average I had in all my years of schooling. Wow. Uh, but no, I, I, I went to undergrad to play football, you know? That's what I wanted to do. And it was a Division three school, so, so they, they weren't giving So they let you alone academically because you were a football no, player, I, No, right? it was a Division three school, so oh. there's no, no there athletic tie-in. There's no athletic oh, scholarship. Oh. So, no, I, had, I mean, I had to get decent grades to stay in school. Right. But uh, there was, you know, no help, you know. 
So now an MBA in marketing. Marketing and research. So what kind of what kind of class, what kind of studying are you doing for that? Um, are you doing? Do you have to do math? I had to do statistics yeah. for the first time in my life, and you know what? I didn't mind it. Really? And all other kinds of math, I didn't. I mean, I did terrible on the SATs. I did, you know, and, and I'm just not a good test taker. Me either. But those statistics came back into play. Um, so the last two thirds of my MBA, Ford mm -hmm. Motor Company paid for. I was working for Ford in the export division in Newark, New Jersey. And and what are you doing? I was an export sales coordinator. I had a territory which was Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. And I had to manage cars going back and forth that were being sold through all the dealers. Um, it was about a, about a thirty million dollar territory. I was going to say, so you're making money. I wasn't making a lot of money, but I was making better money that, than I made any place else. You know, it was. So, it, like, what kind of jobs did you have, like, before? Like in uh, college my and first stuff. job out yeah. of college, I was a, um, a, a management trainee at Two Guys. Now, two you, Guys. Now for those of you who don't know Two Guys, think of four steps below Walmart. <laughs> That's what Two Guys was. Two Guys from Harrison. And, two um, Guys, I yeah, love it. And then I left there, then I went and sold Monroe calculators, and then uh, I ran a disco for a while. Um, there was a chain of, of restaurants in New Jersey, steak restaurants, called... Uh, not steak and brew. Oh no, you're gonna Ken say my Emerson own. Steak Restaurants. Okay. And after nine o'clock, they had a disco, so I was managing the disco. Okay, wow. <laughs> so, so, but you, so you were like really like a business guy. Yeah. Like everything about you was a business guy, business head, business yeah. guy, yeah. money. Yeah, business. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I so, wanted to be Darren Stevens. Oh. I wanted to be an ad man, you know, and I ended up. Being that basically uh, on the other end with McCall's and publishing. So what um, on the other end? So when yeah. you got to McCall's, so yeah. what made you go from Ford to McCall's? Ford laid me off. Oh, nice. It was 1980. I received my MBA, and Ford said to me, "You know, we're not doing so good. You got to go." I'd been there for four and a half years, and so I had done my master's thesis. Instead of doing a thesis, I did a project. I did an annual marketing plan for one of McCall's magazines because my girlfriend was working there at the time. And it was a 200 page research document, 200 page annual marketing plan. So I presented it to McCall's mm -hmm. and they created a job for me. Wow. Yeah. So I ended so, up- you know, Pete, uh, does somebody have a question relating to this? You look like you're- Oh, uh, not yet. Oh, okay. You look like you were- well, We're gonna say hi to- We're gonna, we're gonna- No. Yeah. <laughs> say hi to Pete George. Wait, Pete, come into the shot for a minute and yeah. say hello. Right. And Pete's a stand-up. Pete, he said, Pete yeah. is the rock and roll comedian. Okay, Pete, tell us, where's the gig coming up, Pete? Same one as last week. It's uh, Adele's in San Clemente next Saturday. Yeah. Okay. And then the week after that at Rockies in Rockies. Temecula. And then, okay. uh, yeah, we're still working on dates for the MGM in Cleveland and oh, great. a few other right. things. So, Pete George, look for him. He's I'll be, funny. I'll be over there. Because <laughs> I'm union. Pete, Pete killed me last night. I was saying, uh, how long does the GPS say it's going to take me to get to Peter's house? And uh, 30 minutes. And what did, what did Pete say? I said, but from Mid-Wilshire, two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Just, yes. And course. it's actually not that far from the truth. Um, so I'm, I'm not looking at any of these. Yet. Wow, there's a lot of people. And there's a lot of people. And they're sending up hi and love. And, 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 and hi, Penny. Um, I'll, look, I'll look at you guys in a little bit. And we'll talk to you. But I want to hear this story. Okay, so you, so now you're in McCall's. Right. You're, they've created a job for you. That's very flattering. Right, that's cool. And you're making decent? Making more money than the last job. Okay, you know, making that's, more money. You know, and doing, doing pretty good, you know, back in those days. Although that salary now, you couldn't get an apartment, you know. Wow, but yeah. But it was, you know. Yeah, and so. Uh, you living in the city? No, I still, still was in living Jersey? in New Jersey. Okay. Yep. Um, is McCall's in New Jersey? No, it's right on Park Avenue. My office was the Helmsley building that Park Avenue goes through. Wow. You know, right through. My mother was on 35th and Park. It's right great, there. Yeah. It's, it was a great building. It was wow. great. I loved working there. It was a great time. And, uh, and then uh, something happened. One, I, my old girlfriend who worked at McCall's mm -hmm. uh, dumped me. And uh, by that time, I was. Well, in, whoever you are. You live to regret this, you did. No, she's doing okay. <laughs> she's doing okay. She's doing all right. And, and then Jeanette, by that time, um, Jeanette was in the improv group, my wife, mm -hmm. uh, and I was still at McCall's. And so that's where we met. We met in an improv group. And a couple of years into my job at McCall's... Okay, so wait. Tell me again how you got to the... Somebody, get, a girlfriend gave you... 
a see, one class well, deal. She for bought Joey me a Novick. one night stand class and that Joey Nova grant. Now, what made her do that though? What? Because I was going. We were leaving the city after seeing these headliners like Seinfeld and those guys at uh, Improv. Right. And I kept saying, well, I think I could do that. And she said, screw you. Here, I bought you a class. Let's see if you can. You okay, know? so now what made you think you could do that? What, what, what in your life prepared you for that? I come from a bunch of nuts <laughs> and, and storytellers, you know? Uh. And, and, and uh, you know, if I, if I, you know, I'll tell you stories about my grandfather. I mean, there was no Okay, better, tell us the story about your grandfather. There was no better... I will learn my timing from my grandfather, and he didn't even know how funny he was. <laughs> right, you know? of course. Um, so Where was your grandfather from? My grandfather was from Murulucano, uh, Murulucano. Italy, um, Potenza is the province. And uh, did he speak fluent English? Well, he spoke broken English. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He used to say, "Thank you too much." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cute. <laughs> so, uh, but one time he had a he had an old Victrola. In his cell. Okay, now let's explain what a Victrola is. We were just yeah. going through this. Crank up record player with the records that you could eat dinner off of and then play, you know? <laughs> They're so thick. So um, it was in his cellar for years, and I looked at the thing. And, and I a Victrola antiques. was a piece of furniture. It yeah. wasn't just a turntable. It, it was, was like the home a... entertainment system. <laughs> That's there right. was nothing else. There was yeah. a radio and a Victrola. That was right. it. Um, there, you know, he didn't have TV, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I said to him one time, I said, you don't want that Victrola, do you? You know, you know. He says, "No, nah, that's a piece of shit." The old man, he'll take. <laughs> so I take the Victrola, and I'm refurbishing the whole thing, and I take the back panel off, and out of the back panel falls this plastic bag, with four letters, a dried flower, and a picture. Now you see in my house here, I have all my family pictures. I brought it all from New Jersey. I don't know who this woman is. I've never seen her before. No, wait a minute. Your grandfather's still alive. Yeah. Okay. So I said to my mother, I said, hey, I found these letters. It's her father. Yeah, it's her father. I said, I found these letters in the back of the Victrola. Um, I think they're grandpa's, you know? And she says, well, what was the postmark? And I said, it was 1948. She goes, oh, that's when your grandfather had an affair and got kicked out of the house. Oh, she knew. Yeah. So I said, um, well, leak the story to him and see what he says. So he comes up to me at Easter or Thanksgiving. I don't know what uh -huh. it was. And I was still living in Booth at the same time. Yeah. And we always had big meal and we always had a big intermezzo, you know. And he says, hey, Pete, maybe if we get a break at the dinner, I come down your house, I look at them with letters. I said, yeah, we could look at the letters. So we go down there, right? And he looks at him and he goes, no, nah, this is not mine. I says, it says Donato Scarisi all over the front. He goes, oh, yeah, that mine. <laughs> I said, so what happened, right? <laughs> well, his shoot, his cobbler shop was in Dendo, New Jersey. The next town over was Dover. And he was planning to go to Italy on vacation. So he says, well, I was planning one time to go to Italy on vacation. And this woman come to my store from Dover. And I say, I was to go to Italy for a little while. And she says she have a daughter, which live in Bologna. And if I pass by over there, to look up at this door. He says... So well, he was already living here. Oh, yeah, he was here. He says, but I was, you know, I was passed by over there, so I, you know, but he was going from Rome to Naples. That's like going to Vegas to get to San Francisco, <laughs> right? He says, but I was passed by over there. <laughs> and he says, uh, I was look up at this girl. <laughs> and I was thinking I was no married. But I was. <laughs> <laughs> I, says, I was thinking oh, I was no yeah. So I said, no shit you were. What happened? He says... And he already had kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. Your mother, mother remembered. Oh, yeah. My mother was oh, in high school. Um, so he, he said, uh, well, he says, your grandmother, she find the letters. And she throw me out of the house a couple of months. I go to my friend Vern who lives in Florida. <laughs> and then I come back, right? <laughs> now my mother says she remembers my grandmother, who was like this tall on the phone to the woman in Dover in, a, in Italian saying, you see this dried flower? That's the way your daughter gonna dry up before she go to my husband. <laughs> Click. That was Danny, my grandpa Danny, yeah. Wow. Piece of work, piece of work, man. He, he And so he, but he somehow managed to hide, the, to keep the letters and, and hide the back them. back screwed into the back of the Victrola. Wow. 
Oh, he was. That's a really sweet story, no, actually. Was, I'd kill know, him if he was mine, but sure, that's a really you know, sweet you know, story. He, well, he'd pay for it. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like he did. But he had, he had, uh, he had a great time, and when he retired, he mm -hmm. thoroughly expected to go back and forth to Italy, be a big shot. And my grandmother got Parkinson's, mm -hmm. so she used to sit on the couch watching TV, and I went to. Um, I went to his house and he smoked, so he had to be outside, he couldn't smoke inside. So he's on the porch smoking. And we're sitting talking, I hear, and I go, what the hell is that? There was a buzzer. He says, I gotta move your grandmother around a little bit. So he go in, he take the bathroom or something, right? So two weeks later, he's out in, in a tomato plant smoking in a garden like this, and I walk out and we're talking, and I hear a cowbell. The ding, the ding, the ding. I said, what the hell is that? He goes, now your grandmother should break the goddamn buzzer already, right? So now we're walking back and you hear the ding, the ding. He goes, I'll tell you, Pete, 50 years I'm a shoemaker. Now I'm a cow. <laughs> I said, you got that right. Oh, that's that's fabulous. Oh, so, did it skip a generation, or was your was your mother funny? Was your mother funny? My mother had had a pretty dry sense of humor. Mm -hmm. so my mother was a smart aleck. She always was prepared with an answer. That for sure, mm -hmm. you know. My father was a more joyous comic. My father really enjoyed life. My my mother didn't enjoy life as much as my father did. My father was a guy, you know, when he was driving around on estimates, would go and stop at the gas station where some of my cousins worked or whatever, and you know, tell jokes and then get in the car, oh. and, you know. So both of them were, you know, mm -hmm. were pretty funny, you know, but in very, very different ways. And how about singing? Did anybody sing from your family? My father's cousins, had fantastic voices like Irish tenors mm. or the Venturini family um, but uh, no I mean, in fact my mother's one one of my mother's unique forms of punishment was <laughs> to sit my brother and I on the steps and sing to us because she had the worst voice <laughs> in the world and if we got up she'd tell my father and he'd whack us when he came up yeah. so now so so in the family, I, mean, I assume you had like big family meals yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Are people singing? Is there are people telling jokes? What's going telling on? Telling jokes, yelling at each other. Yeah. You know, telling telling each other. You don't know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. You know, you know somebody makes bread. I know somebody makes cake. <laughs> you know, that's you know, for, you know, you know. Oh, no, that's not good. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, and it's you know. So I just sit there watching this, and I'm going, okay, it's all going up here. Because you you're great with voices. Did, did they do voices? Voices or well, sometimes when they were telling a joke or trying to tell a story or yeah. something like that. But but you know a lot of them. You know my grandparents all spoke broken English. You know my father's mother. My father's father died in 1961, and his mother was there right where they ran the construction company out of. So she was always there. You know and and in fact one time Jeanette and her partner Mimi used to do the Catskills. So they take the bus out and they take my car, which was parked in New Jersey, and drive up to the Catskills. So they would spend half an hour, an hour with my grandmother before they took off. And Jeanette does this great impersonation of my grandmother. She goes, oh, honey, you should have seen my shape. I was a dead devil, honey. Right? So they, she was... All right, I have to talk to Jeanette because my father was an MC in the Catskills. That's, oh, yeah. that, my whole life was up there, so I have to find out what hotel yeah, she yeah, was at. Yeah. So, okay, so... So you have the bug only because you come from this storytelling. That's it. Yeah, that funny. was that was the only thing was just to. But were you doing it? Like, would the kids get up and perform? Would you perform like stuff? And I was forced to play my accordion oh. most of the time. Pete's father is I know, a, he's like a master. Yes, accordion. I gotta yeah. go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just actually just telling Pete that I used to. I had such stage fright. That I used to play in the kitchen, under the kitchen table, while my relatives were in the living room. Oh. Now, if you know an accordion, the bellows, and my <laughs> legs were skinny, get caught in freaking oh, bellows yeah. and all that stuff. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, but yeah, and I was telling Pete that um, um, my I was doing an interview. I, th I think it was for Esquire one time, and, and and the interviewer said, "What's the worst piece of advice or counsel you ever got?" And I said, "Well." I was 14 years old. I had been playing the accordion for 10 years. I started when Wait, I was, what? Yeah, I was playing in gigs with my teacher to promote the school and stuff. Um, you, you were four. You, the accordion was four. bigger than you. Yeah, my what? grandfather brought an accordion back from Italy. It looked like a Chevy. Yeah, it was right. sitting up like this, and I had to, get a, you know, I had to sell it and get a smaller one. So, um, yeah, it looked, it looked like a Chevy. It was marble blue and big <laughs> grill on it and all that stuff. So... Um, this woman said, what was the worst piece of counsel you ever got? And I said, when I was 14 years old, I said to my mother, 
I don't want to play the accordion anymore. I want to play the guitar. My mother said, oh, honey, the guitar is just a fad instrument. The accordion is a contemporary <laughs> instrument and will always be popular. <laughs> the guitar is a fad instrument. It's a fad instrument. instrument. <laughs> Thanks, it. mom. I love it. That's Thanks, fabulous. Mom. Did you ever make? Did you ever give her a little zest for that one? Oh, she oh. didn't even know. She was happy to be uh, mentioned in the article. Yeah. She had no idea. You know. Oh, that's too sweet. <laughs> All right, so let's get back. Okay, good. We have Constantine. Would like to know: Has your business background uh, with marketing helped you with managing your acting career and getting out there? Yes, my initially, absolutely, my business background helped me because I I didn't have any acting training except for the improv that I was doing. And so I marketed myself. I did only commercials because I knew I could sustain a character for, you know, for three minutes. So tell for, us for tell, tell us what marketing yourself, because there, was, there are a lot of people who are trying to do that. And you had these two forces yeah. coming together. So what, what did that look like for you? Well, part of the, the thing that saved me was that I did have a career that I loved right. in marketing. Uh -huh. So when I went into an audition, I wanted it as bad as anybody else, but I didn't need it. I love that. Okay? It, I didn't need it. And, and There's no desperation no, there. No, nothing. And, and so, I, you know, uh, I was lucky at the time. I almost didn't have to market myself because when I got into the business in 1986, um, I was 33 years old. I can't believe... I the, feel like you've been around forever. Well, it feels like it. I know. Well, no, but I mean, it's just like I grew up with you. We're the same yeah. age, more or yeah. less, and I yeah. grew up with you. So, it feels like you've always been on TV, but... Well, okay. that's, you know, and so, uh, you know, uh, at that time, the stereotypes they were casting commercials for. Oh, yeah. Ha, I did you're, beer commercials. I did all, you know, that's what I did first. But you're not like the white Anglo. No, because the stereotypes at that time in 1986 that they yeah. were looking for, they said, we want Bruce Willis, we want Bruce Springsteen, <gasps> we want Tony Danza, or we want Billy Joel. And I went, piece of each. <laughs> Holy. You know. So the timing. Which came first, Moonlighting or um, Civil Wars? Oh, Moonlighting was way before Civil Wars. Because they definitely. Yeah. I wasn't right? even in business when Moonlighting came out. Okay. Wow. Yeah. 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 yeah that's, that, that's. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Uh huh. So um, we'll get to that. So you know, and and the other thing that happened in, in terms of I want to answer his question mm -hmm. in another way too. Uh, later, way later on, when I had a, a modicum of success and I had to look at my contracts. It both hurt me and helped me. How did it hurt you? Well, because I knew that these contracts were bogus and, and they were bullshit and they were like writs of slavery, not real contracts. And I called back the agent. I said, what is this? This is not a contract. The contract is mutual benefit bailment and blah, blah, blah. And the agents would go, shut up. <laughs> the fuck? Just shut up. Sign a friggin' thing. Sign a contract, right? Um, there was one point uh, when, I, when I was negotiating for a series lead and the network pegged me at a certain amount, and um, the production company said, no, we're going to give you this. And then my manager and agent said, no, we want this. And so it came to a point where we were a couple thousand dollars away. Mm -hmm. So I stepped in and did what I would do in a marketing situation. I said, all right, let's tell them that I'll do it for this amount. But that contract binds me to 5% bumps for the next five years. I want the jump to what I want the second year, and then the 5% bumps, because that's an act of good faith. That means I'm going to bust my ass to make sure that show makes it to the second right. season. And if it does, you owe me what I was asking for. Wow, I like it. And so, so that's where it came in. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, too, even my research background, um, I had a short-lived sitcom called Joe's Life. I remember Joe's Life. And George Vincenzo, rest in peace, mm -hmm. a beautiful man, played my brother. And... Um, he, uh, we were sitting there in the upfronts, you know, when they interview all, you know, the stars of the show, and this was right after Civil Wars, and uh, somebody from the press uh, stood up and said, "What do you think of the ratings game and the fact that Civil Wars was a critically acclaimed show, but didn't make it, you know, uh, through to the third season?" Which is insane. Well, but that was right around the time that cable really started to infiltrate, mm. really started to infiltrate, nineteen ninety two, ninety three. Cable was taking taking. So people. all that sexiness now. There's nudity. There's right, yeah, right. that going so, on. So, but I said, listen, and I launched into this recitation of of uh, research samples, three pronged demographics, <laughs> raw respondents, <laughs> infusion of of of, uh, of uh, randomness into <laughs> sample size, and I looked up. It was like looking into a barrel of trout. 
And I went, oh, sorry. That's another life, you know? And even my executive producer was looking at me, he was what the f*** are you talking about? And what I meant to say to all these people, what I, what I did say at the end, I said, hey, the conclusion of this is that Nielsen at the time had like 1,200 people. That was their sample size. Right. Once you enter the cross-tabulation of household income, presence of children, and, and one other thing, that means in raw respondents, there's probably like 10 people that they factor up. Really? Yeah. And so 10 people say whether or not Civil War stays on the air. Wow. I said, you see, you see what you're doing here? And I said, and another thing. I said, if you're going to use numbers to kill a show, then you should use those same numbers to save a show because the icons of programming like MASH, mm -hmm. like Kill Street Blues, like you name it, you can go right down the road, mm -hmm. we're all on the chopping block. Really? They had terrible numbers. Really? Kill Street, Kill Street was on a chopping block. Oh. MASH was on a chopping block. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it was MASH, yeah. Uh, Seinfeld. Seinfeld. Seinfeld did not do well at the beginning. Seinfeld yeah, reformed yeah. it. It was called the Seinfeld Chronicles. Right. In fact, here's a great story. Julie Louis-Dreyfus is, is married to Brad Hall. Yes, I love he, Brad. Hi, Brad. Brad. He watches sometimes. Brad was supposed to be here last night. He's in Aww. Jeanette's. Jeanette and Brad did uh, Santa Barbara Theater together. They knew each other in Santa Barbara. Did she go to school in Chicago? Did, how they did both she... went to Northwestern. Hi, Gary Kroger. <laughs> so here's the funny thing. Is okay. My son, I get done with the, with the pilot of Cop Rock at 3 in the morning. And it was my son, talk about that. Sebastiano's first birthday. And, and I had met Julie and Brad when they were on SNL, but I wasn't in the business at the time. Jeanette and I were going out, I was still at McCall's. So the next time I met them was here in California when I was in the business, and Julie walks in with Brad, and I said, well, what are you doing? She goes, uh, you know, they want me to do this thing called the Seinfeld Chronicles. <laughs> I don't know. And I said, well, I know Seinfeld's really funny. You know, she goes, I don't know, I'll be the only girl, I don't know. Wow. I still remember her saying that in the drive. Wow. She might not admit it, but she did. But wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and love. By the way, Lynn Stewart's. Hi, Lynn. We were talking Hi, about you before. Lynn Hi, said Lynn. you're telling great stories. Oh. Um, all right, let's stop for a second. What, what else is going on? Who's saying what, Pete? Let's uh, say hi to some people. Question. Um, hi, Brian. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Gail. Somebody's going to ask you to play guitar. <laughs> I don't know about I the can't. guitar, but I'm, I'm going to make. I'm going to make you sing something before we go. You're going to sing know, something. Somebody wants you to play accordion. <laughs> so that was me. Joe Friday, Mickey. Oh, that was you. John Green. Hi, Rick Singer. Hi, oh. Nick. I'm saying hi to everybody. What? You got a question? Tell us, uh, Jeff Bar uh, Barry says, tell us about Frank Stevens, uh, your recent character. Uh, Frank Stevens was, I think, in, um, in a movie of the week. I have to go back and figure that one out. I think. Oh, am I right? Okay. Didn't uh, say. I don't know, but somebody else said to ask you about somebody on the thing on the Facebook today, and now I can't remember who the person was that they told me to ask I'm you about. I'm trying to remember what Frank Stevens. I paid like two fr francs. If he can come back and tell me what movie that. Lori Nelson, you told me to ask him about somebody, and I can't remember who it is, but I remember it was you, Lori. Sorry about that. I, um, I played three francs, I think. And I can't remember. What, I, I remember that Frank Stevens. You look like a. Fr you can get that Frank. My thing son's going name on. is Frank Francesco. Oh, oh there you go. Yeah. So Barry Sobel, do you know Barry? He's a comic. Yeah, Barry. yeah, yeah Barry. Barry. So Barry's from watching, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and Penny, yeah. hi Barry. Barry, hi, Barry used to do, I think he was, he did Comedy U around the same time we did, uh, we did Comedy U, and, and they were doing, he was doing big stuff. He was doing yeah, yeah. Catch and, mm -hmm. and the improv and stuff, but Gary and I, just Kippermans were just bouncing around downtown. <laughs> we, we didn't get as good as, as Barry. Bill Isaacson, hello. Myrna, mm -hmm. hi, MS. Let's go. So who else am I saying hi to before we... Are there any questions, Pete? Because I'm just saying yeah, the names. Uh, hi, hi, Peter, Maria. Hi, hi, Maya. Me, you both should do a duet. I would love to hear you both sing. <laughs> yeah, you don't want... I <laughs> sing like Peter's mother. You don't, That would be the torture of the century that you do not want to hear, trust me. So, so how did... How did the singing? So, all right, in improv, did you, is that where you started to sing? Because you, were... I, I, you know, Hal Peller, who was running the improv group, um, mm -hmm. um, and now uh, does improv uh, for companies internationally. Uh -huh. um, he took over after Joey uh, left, and um, he asked me one night to sing, and I went, "Oh man, I, I, you know, I don't know, you know." So we had to you sing. had not sang at all. I had, I, had, I had sung in two friends' weddings, but way up in the choir loft, past the, the, the line of sight, I made sure I was past, nobody could see who it was. I'm, I'm uh, just having a really hard time with this, because I watched a bunch of the videos today again from Cop. I mean, you have a really good voice. It's not. It's untrained. No, no, it's, it untrained is bad. 
I know, but it was it, it fit it fit cop rock because it fit, it, it fit the reality of the moment because because most everybody on cop rock were, were, were trained voices. Kathleen Wilhoit's a really good friend. I love Kathleen. Kathleen. knows Jeanette. She and Jeanette uh, oh. from Santa Barbara. Kathleen Wilhoit. What There's a, a voice. Vo oh, yeah, what okay. a voice on in her. In fact, Kathleen Wilhoit's last scene in the pilot of Cop Rock was so brilliant. That song that she did was a Randy Newman song because the cop, the pilot of Cop Rock was all written by Randy Newman. Right. That Randy Newman put that into Faust when he did when he oh, read wow. it in Faust. Uh -huh. But I'll tell you a story about that. So we're at the upfronts here in, in LA, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting at the Sioux City, Iowa table, right? And and uh, so they play this last scene, this incredible last. Well acted, well sung, She's beautiful. Un oh, probably one of the best scenes in television. I don't care what anybody says. Not because I was in the show. She sings a lullaby to her baby and then sells it into adoption for two hundred dollars drug money. It's on YouTube. I just watched that yeah. scene. Wow. Okay. You could hear a pin drop. Mm. And this guy, who was the head of the affiliates from Sioux City, Iowa, says, "Oh hell, she wouldn't sing when she sells her baby." I went, "Okay, we're fucked." Uh, uh, this is the guy who's got to like the show. We're right. screwed. Right. We're screwed. He doesn't get it. He's right. never been to a musical. No. You know? Well, but but Cop Rock was way ahead of yeah. its time. Yeah. And you know what? There were some times when it really didn't work. It really didn't work at, at all. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, like, we, some, like, some numbers give me, that give didn't us work. an example. Um, I, I, yeah. Not of a specific number, but like, why wouldn't it work? I, I think because the, the song was... When, when they came out of the reality of situation, like the songs that I did, two of them worked really well because the one where you're sitting at your bed when you're they, you have, they have yeah they have the, the stripper, stripper comes yeah in. the stripper comes that's yeah perfection the way they melded into that and also the really, one in the jail there's one in the, the jail. jail it goes from the holding cell but see those came out of the reality and and right. a lot of times they didn't come out of reality so normal viewing audiences didn't get it you know and but but. They didn't want to suspend, you know, with... Like, how did they not come out of the reality? Like, how would they not come out of the reality? Well, even in the pilot, um, yeah. um, when Carl Anderson, mm -hmm. who you know, played uh, Judas in the movie Jesus Christ Superstar, one of the greatest voices around, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, uh, he, I bring this guy to, to, to trial, and uh, he says, has the jury reached his verdict? And it... And, and Lewis Price, I believe it was, stands up and says, yes, we have, Your Honor. And he goes, hit it. And the guy who was the court stenographer lifts up his desk and starts playing the piano. And this Randy Newman rag. And it swoops in on Lewis Price. And he goes, he's guilty, Judge, he's guilty. <laughs> you know? And Carl Anderson starts going. In. And then all, when you next cut back to the jury, they're in choir robes. <laughs> I, I, I've going, seen that one's on YouTube too. Yeah, it's like they're all there, you know. <laughs> yeah. And but that one worked because it, it was it was really bold. Right. But sometimes in the middle, sometimes it, it, you know it what just wasn't there. And we had two Academy Award winners uh, on our writing staff. We had Amanda McBroom who wrote The Rose. Wow. And my friend Donnie Markowitz uh, who wrote the uh, uh, Time of My Life for Dirty Dancing. Wow. And Donnie and I stayed friends. He's in he's in uh, uh, Louisiana right now, but. Uh, but he was brilliant. He's a brilliant guitarist, you know, brilliant writer, and we had a lot of great people. And do you know that Cheryl Crow sang background in two episodes? Did she? Oh. No, I didn't you know can look that. It up. You look up Cop Rock, Cheryl Crow, you'll see her in the background. She sang background in two episodes of Cop Rock. You know, and for those of you who don't know about Cop Rock, hmm, describe, describe. What, 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 was, what was the log line for Cop Rock? Law and Order, Rhythm and Blues. <laughs> it was a musical cop show. Yeah. Right. Um, Where the drama was as good as NYPD, mm -hmm. uh, but in it, it, every once in a while, a song would come out of that drama, you know, and whether it came out organically or not was the success or failure of the show. So what was your audition like for that? That was really mm -hmm. weird, because, <laughs> like I said, I, I wasn't a singer. You okay, know? so what singing had you done prior to Cop Rock? Uh, it, no, stop. Nothing, just the, uh, you know, the improv show once or twice, and then these three The little Siamese twins? No, no, I, I did a scene, uh, you know, where I sang Am I Blue was the first thing okay. I ever sang. But then I did three friends weddings where I sang like Billy Joel tunes or something, I, I can't remember. So you were singing lead at the wedding? 
Or, you, no, you, I was just singing one song. Like I said, up in the choir. But, I mean, but you were singing the, the main voice. You were yeah, singing. yeah, yeah. It was so, just, just okay. me. So I get there, and I didn't know what to do. So I asked Jeanette. She goes, pick something easy, you know? <laughs> so I picked uh, Fats Domino, uh, Blue Monday, right? So Wow. I, you know, there might be people out there, Peter, <laughs> that don't know how that goes. So, <laughs> so the guy's going, the, 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 uh, um, and, and Mike Post was the music director. Okay, a friend of mine is very good friends with, uh, Snuffy Walden, very good friends with Mike Post, and he was telling me he was the musical guy. For, yeah, Mike uh, Post was the music yeah. director, so he, you know, collected everything, mm-hmm. made sure it was, you know, Mike Post was just genius. So the, the accompanist starts playing, he's going, dun, 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 boom, boom. That Mike goes, wait, wait, wait. He goes, did you look? It's in this time, three quarter of time, whatever it's supposed to be. Ba 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 ba. So I said, Mike, lay off him. It says Antoine Domino. He didn't realize it was Fats Domino, right? Oh. So, so I just went, Blue Monday. How I hate Blue Monday. You know, I work like a slave all day. So that you know. That was. He sang, by the way. He and, sang, okay. And so, so that. But, it was but you easy. really have that voice. You have that voice. You have a singer's voice. You do. I, you know, I, I thank you. I uh, mean, did you ever want to? Did you ever think about? Love to. I love to have a small Vegas act. Yeah, like you know, a little. I, actually, with my wife, I, I think Jeanette has perfect pitch. She has an incredible voice. Wow! Does she I've sing? Never heard, yeah, she sang. I mean, she was a character at Disneyland, and then she became. Um, what was her character at Disneyland? Oh, she did everything from Chip and Dale to whoever. She wasn't <laughs> tall enough for Goofy. So, uh, and then she took the costume off and was um, um, Mary Poppins and actually oh, wow. sang. Oh, wow. You know, uh, and went on tour. She had a fantastic voice. Oh, wow. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've never heard a voice like hers that is like her speaking voice. It's so comfortable. So did she do musical theater? Yeah. Oh, okay, she did Godspell. She toured with Godspell. Oh, with okay. Brad. I, I think, no, Brad wasn't in the same production as she was in. But, um, yeah, she toured with Godspell, and, and she did, uh, she did incredible. She won't sing anymore because she says she lost it yelling at soccer games <laughs> for her boys. You know? Lynn Three Stewart. sons. Lynn Stewart has a question. Okay, Lynn. Uh, tell the wedding band story about your mom. The wedding band story about your mom. Oh. So... Jeanette and I were getting married in New Jersey, and she was out here doing her show at uh, the Lex with Mimi, her, her writing partner, but they had a character comedy that they wrote. It was brilliant. They won all kinds of drama long awards. Mm. So I was fighting with my mother on Jeanette's behalf, and she didn't care. She said, no, just let your mother do what she wants. I said, no, 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 you can't do it that way. So uh, my mother said, you have to have a band. You have to have I said, no, we don't want a band. we got a disc jockey. He's going to play everything from big band right up. It's going to be fantastic. Oh, no. What year did you get married? 88. So, um, 88, yeah. Big disc right. jockey years, yeah. yeah. So, um, we had this guy hired, and he was a, a friend of mine's brother, and he was a professional event disc jockey. Mm-hmm. And he had everything. It was everything that we wanted, right? So, um, my mother kept saying, oh, why don't you have a band? Have, have a band, you know? I said, no, we don't want a band. We want everybody to be happy. We're going to have all this music, you know? So, um, the so week wait, you're before, already successful, 1988. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the week before um, our wedding, mm-hmm. the week before, the Saturday before, the Saturday we got married, I get an answering a message on my answering machine in New York from this disc jockey. I don't know what I did. I must have double booked. Oh my God. I can't do your wedding. Now, what would a professional do? I have this other guy that I always work with. He'll do. That was it. I can't do your wedding. Click. The next message on my machine was my mother saying, <laughs> I hope you reconsider the Herb Daniels combo isn't booked for Saturday and we can get them. Oh, my God. I know she paid off this disc, John. Oh, stop! And the Herb Daniels combo did my wedding. And Herb was the florist. Stop. He was the florist in town. And his son was my, one of my best friends from... From school. So Jeanette said... Are you telling me your mother rigged your wedding? Absolutely. (laughs) And Jeanette said, I don't care as long as they don't play New York, New York. When we walked in, that was the first friggin' thing they played. So she got it back. She got it back. That was exactly the Wow. 
That is, I cannot believe your mother. I oh, can't yeah. believe. Oh yeah, man. Oh yeah. <laughs> she was a Oh, that she is. A thank you, Lynn. That was a good one. <laughs> All right, so all right, so we're reeling it back. So you so you take the yeah. improv class. You start doing stand up. You fall in love with Jeanette. How does how does improv get you? You doing some stand up too, right? Well, yeah. Here's what happened. I uh, I don't know. Did I tell the story yet? I was at McCall's. Yeah. And um, I had some of my research published in Ad Age. Yes, you did say this. Okay. Yeah. So when no wait. I, that was how you got the job at McCall's. That's no, the story. No. no, but that's the story you told us that you came in with stuff. No, and I came in you. with my thesis. Okay. But while I was there, about about the third or fourth year that I was there, mm -hmm. um, I had some of my research published in Advertising Age. So I started getting calls from P&G and all these big package goods firms about, where'd you get this research? I said, you you subscribe to the same research companies that I do. It's all in there. But I'll tell you what, so that your people don't have to go back and do all the work, I will ship you this ton of raw research that I did wow. if you'll take out a package of ads in my magazine. Smart. So that all worked out. And then they started calling me again and saying, hey, do you, uh, you know, you want to come over, blah, 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 here's what we want to pay. And it was good money. And I went back to my boss. And my boss and I were friends. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a Sharon house in the Hamptons, all that yuppie shit that, we, <laughs> that everybody did, right? Which Hampton? Um, oh, West Hampton Beach. That's where we okay. were. Okay. And um, so she said to me, well, the publisher doesn't know what you do. And I said, really? So I said, wait right there. I went back into my office and I got a loose leaf notebook that I had been keeping for the last four years. I came back in her office and I said, now before I open this notebook, I want you to remember where I came to you from. I came to you from Ford Motor Company. If you learn anything at Ford, you learn how to cover your ass. Wow. So I opened the book <laughs> and in there were notes that I had made on days when I had pitched to her something and then a tear sheet from the magazine when it affected it. I said, who's the publisher that think did this? And that really pissed her off. Wow. So she started nice. making my life miserable. She took away the creative writing and wanted mm. me just to crunch numbers, and I was getting frustrated. Jeanette said, uh, I think you could be an actor. I said, really? So I can starve and have four jobs like you? So when I took the ice pack off my eye, <laughs> I, I enrolled in a, in a crash course in commercials from Bob Collier. Recovering wow, alcoholic. Bob Collier. And I, uh, within a week, I was on hold for a national beer commercial. A week? And within two years, I was on my first TV job and making more money. At Kate and Alley was my first TV job. Wow. And my first movie, basically, big movie, was Goodfellas. Michael Giroli, good for yeah. him. Yeah, is he? I love him. I adore him. Yeah. Wow, he, that, that's cool. And that's, that's, not, that's not luck. The, what is luck? It's opportunity meets perseverance, right. which is exactly and preparedness. And preparedness you know, absolutely. Yeah, you know, and you know, and, and like I said, I I don't have much training, and that's one of the things that I'm always embarrassed about. You did, know? You, did you did you did you study at all? Did you study? I anything? started studying with um, a friend of mine, Lily Parker, uh, and her husband Peter Flood. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, they're both out here now, but Lily's a school teacher, and, and Peter uh, works for Universal. I think it's the last thing he did. But they stopped teaching. They were both members of the actor's studio. Mm -hmm. and uh, But for maybe a half a year or a year, and, and that, then I was started that, working. And you, that was before you started working? You did it in... While I was doing commercials. Uh -huh. I was already doing commercials and working because I had the money to pay for a class. You know? And so you were being the Bruce Willis... The... Right, in the beer commercials. And, uh, and the other thing that helped me out was we had another actress friend who's, who had a, a, a job at a marketing firm called... Uh, Center for Concept Developments. She said, my boss would love to meet you. So I went into this guy. And as a what? As a marketing consultant. Okay. He said, listen, um, you have five years uh, expertise in the women's market. You know, I can use somebody like you. Here's what I'm proposing. He said, you come in, whatever it is, one day a month or two days a month, whenever I need you, and you meet with... Uh, Seagrams and Bronfman and, and, and P&G, you meet with their product uh, uh, development people and you see the market niche that they want to go into. Then you go home and you write up some new product ideas and I will pay you, this is in 1987, okay. $500 a day. What? So I only had to work two days a month to pay my expenses as an actor, 
right? Wow. And and but but it was the, it was my twelve years in the business world before that that had wow. given me that you know that edge. So I would go in and then I would I would present my products. I'd go with twenty one new products to them, but I would also have because I would call my old friends who were still in the ad business. I said, "Would you run these demographics for me?" So I had what the other consultants didn't have. I had market research. Wow. So that was another blessing. That you, you, you have a lot of smarts. I, I can tell that from your Facebook page, just by the way you post. You have a lot of smarts. Thanks. I've never been known for that, I have to say. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't believe that's exactly true. You didn't have those jobs, and they, they, they knew what you had. So, okay, so you, so you, how are you segueing from, you're doing improv, Pete, yeah. when you, I'm hearing your change. Can you hear that? I can. It's weird. I'm having I a change mean, in my I heart. I keep wondering who was. You better well, go to the doctor. Speaking of a comment and a okay. question. Yeah, go ahead. Jill Stacy says, I'm sure he is saying some very interesting things, but I can't get my eyes off those arms. <laughs> Thanks. I worked on it. Uh, okay. Just for you. Yeah. And then uh, Kimmy says, uh, do any of your sons want to act? Yes, my oldest son is an actor. He just got a SAG card. He's doing nice. voiceovers. I know I said stay in voiceovers, you know. You know. But he's really talented. Um, my twins, uh, uh, one is down here now. He's in between jobs. He was working for a market research firm. Um, he's still working for So the they're both going company. in the family business. Yeah, is. and then his twin brother is up in San Francisco and works for uh, Heal the Bay. He's, he went to Santa Cruz, you know, with Earth Shoes and all the other <laughs> nice. stuff. Nice. Wow. It's interesting that they're both so different. One in market research, yeah. And one. Well, they actually went to to different high schools. The twins played against each other for four years oh. in high school. Arch rivals in high school. There's a great story about. We used to call it the Honorati Bowl. So I had two sweatshirts. The Honorati Bowl. I wore one sweatshirt for Crespi, where uh, where one twin went and the older son went, and then the other was Notre Dame. And so I would wear one one half and one half move over. I to think the you side. should have had like from your picture. You should have cut it <laughs> in half right and sewn them I, together. They should have. Oh my God. So there, so uh, I don't know how much you know about soccer, but they my, all my kids were soccer players. They mm -hmm. didn't end up playing football, and they were all defenders. And the two of them, the twins are completely different in many ways. I mean, they're fraternal. They look like brothers, but mm -hmm. but they're not identical. So the one twin who played for Notre Dame, Frank, his game was power in like three moves that always worked. His twin brother, Charlie, was like Gene Kelly. He danced the ball up your ass through your <laughs> nose and make you look like a fool, <laughs> right? He had ball skills. He was and, all finesse. Yeah, all finesse, mm -hmm. all power, right? So Frankie was at the underdog team, Notre Dame, because Crespi had the better soccer team usually. And Frankie steals the ball. And he comes up, right? And some guy comes up to him, boom, he beats him with his incredible speed. Next guy comes up, boom, one of his three moves, boom, boom. And his brother's coming up. They're both defenders. Oh, no. So what does Charlie do? He fouls him. So Frank is setting up the ball. He goes, that's nice. You fucking foul me. That's nice. <laughs> nice. The referee's here and shit. He walks over. He runs over. He goes, what's going on here? So Charlie, the other one who fouled him, says, hey, ref, his shin guards are illegal. They're too small. He goes, fuck you. You took mine this morning before we left the house. <laughs> so if I ever write a soccer movie, that's going to be That's funny. <laughs> oh, my. I can't even imagine what that's like to be parents and have your kids like playing oh, yeah. against each other. Yeah. Oh, what, do you, what do you do? No, they, you know what? They maintain their same friends from grade school and everything. They, just, they, they really negotiated it well. That's really great. Yeah. yeah. Are they close? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Wow. All right. So, all right. So we're getting back to you. So mm -hmm. you, so you're segueing from, so you're doing commercials. Right. Wait. So what, what was your first commercial? Uh, my first commercial was my first national. national where you could see me. I think my first commercial was a Ritz Bits. I actually had a voiceover on Ritz Bits. But my first one was. Um, you do have you, a. I did, You do have a Bruce Willis thing, and yeah, I. Yeah. You do. Yeah. Well, Jersey, Bruce Willis Jersey with, Boys. With hair. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he had hair when I started out. Yeah. Too. Um, <laughs> so my first one was United Airlines. Mm -hmm. um, but the first one that everybody remembers was uh, I, I was in a Miller Lite commercial with Conrad Dobler. You can actually find that on YouTube as well. Oh my God. Conrad Dobler was a dirty football player, mm -hmm. and so they called him the troublemaker, and that's what. Uh, that's what this commercial is about. He goes, they call me the troublemaker, you know. And he says to me, I, heard, I see you drinking a Miller Lite. And I go, yeah, it tastes great. He goes, that's not what he says. 
guy says, let's filling. And I go, it tastes great. And he starts this fight between the two of us and leaves, right? So that was the first one. Um, Hysterical. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay, so so you doing com- how long are you doing commercials? So from 87, 86 to uh, 88, when I got my first job on Kate and Alley, uh, I still did a couple commercials after that. And then I came out here. We came out here in 88 after we got married. And, and Sonny was born out here. Um, and when you get Kate and Alley, does your life change? Um, not a lot, but... Um, I mean, because you're already doing well. National commercials are yeah, good. Yeah, it, well, it was great to be on, on a show to see how that worked, you mm-hmm. know? And, and, of course, that show, was, it was the last season, so uh, there, was, there were camps already, you know? Uh, you know and and mm-hmm. it was hard to... For, it was great for me to see the politics that from su- such a successful show, the politics and, and, and the personalities that could separate that, you know, and, and, and who were together in the beginning, created the success and then separated mm. for whatever reasons, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, yeah, uh, and I actually, uh, we moved out here and I went back to, uh, to finish Kate and Alley. I was flying back and forth. Uh, so that kind of changed my life. I thought, this is kind of cool. I can afford to go fly back and forth. <laughs> But when this is, I, I hope you'll think this is a great story. So, the last episode of Kate and Alley shoots, we shoot in front of an audience Thursday night. Friday, I'm supposed to fly back because my oldest son is due to be born on that Monday, right? Mm-hmm. I get a call back for Scorsese for Goodfellas in Rockefeller Center at 12:30, and I got a 2:30 flight out of JFK to come home, come here, and see my son, my son's birth. So oh. I got to take the call back, right? Oh. So um, here's the, the guy. But you have a wife who understands yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. But so, so this is this guy, Will, before who, talks, who asked about marketing mm-hmm. and stuff. So at that time, Scorsese was hiring for all the small parts like I got mm-hmm. um, cops or mob guys who actually chased, the, you know, or, or cops who chased the mob guys. Mob guys. Or, you know... Like actual mob guys? Actual mob guys or cops that chase those mob guys for the small roles like I got. Right. So the casting director gave us all the same scene to read, right? Mm-hmm. So I walk in and there's these guys with silver sweatsuits, patent leather sneakers and cigars. And the one guy looks at me and he goes, what are you reading for? <laughs> I go, I got the size for something. I know. <laughs> he goes, you don't know him? I go, no, I don't know him. He goes... I know him. You don't look nothing like him. <laughs> I said, well, that's what they gave me. He goes, all right, God bless you, kid. So I walk in, and now, because I'm still close to my days in marketing, I, I, I had this habit of making the meeting mine, even though it was an audition, right? So my so grandfather... So smart. Listen to this. Anybody who's doing it. My grandfather's last name was Scorese. Exact same spelling without the S. Wow. So I make up this story with Scorsese, and I said... I said, before we start, I got to find out if we're related, because I told my grandfather that I was going to read for the great director, Martin Scorsese, and my grandfather said, I think we'll have a cousin at one time, which take the S out of the name, right? <laughs> Scorsese goes, really? Really? Because we can't find our relatives. I go, oh shit, I'm fucked up, right? I said, I said well, where are you from? He goes, Sicily. I go, no fucking way. We're not Sicilians. He goes, what are you? He goes, I said, we're not late times. He goes, ah, you guys drink too early in the morning. I, he goes, you want to do this? I go, yeah, let's do it. And we read the scene, and I ended up getting the job. Wow. So, you know. Very smart. It was, you know, it was a habit, really, you know. Because you're a salesman, yeah. so you know how to sell yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really. And that's what you're doing, and I always say, when I coach people, I say, you know, you're going to an audition with three people. Okay, so tell, tell, tell tips. There's three people. You are three people when you go to an audition. Oh. You're you the person, mm-hmm. you the actor, mm-hmm. and the character that you're playing. Okay? So... Wait a minute, wait you, a minute. You have you a personal life. You have a personal life. Yeah. You have your business life as an actor. Okay. And you have this character that you have to play in that audition that you negotiate, all three of those. And when you get to the point where I am sometimes, you'll go in for a producer, and they're like, how are the kids? I haven't seen the Debbie... And you have to negotiate all that stuff. Or somebody will say, 
I'm, uh, you know, I'm sorry you had to read for this. I said, man, I'm an actor. That's what I do. You know, that speaks to the business side too. You know, it's like this is no, this is the tools that we bring in. This is what we have to do, right? And then there's the character that you create for the audition and what you bring to it. And hopefully, there's not too much of those first two, so you can get right into what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But you have to be prepared for somebody to challenge you on one of those other two levels before mm. you get to do the work that you came in there to do. Wow. And for me, I've been asked a bunch of times, what's a successful audition? And I say, when you execute your choices, that's it. So you have no control over anything Okay, explain, else. explain what that means. So if I have a, an audition for a character um, who is a, 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 a mobster, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And I get this crazy idea that he's a mobster with Tourette's, right? <laughs> so I go in, I'm, I'm like, Hey, you know, uh, you know, some people will look at me and go, what the fuck is he doing? Get out of here, right? Some people understand it's a choice and they'll say, okay, now do it without the Tourette's, you know? But I walk away with having done what I prepared. That's the thing. You can only do what you've prepared. You, you have no control over getting the job. So a successful audition is... Whatever that you're executing the choices that you came in there. Okay, with. so let's say you're gonna you're gonna you're for a cop, but it's a big role. It's a yeah. big cop. Okay, yeah. so I'm guessing you're gonna bring something very specific to this cop so that he's not a generic right. cop, right? right? So what what might be a choice that you would? So Tourette's with a mobster. What might you like if you were going in tomorrow to read for the lead role in a new cop show? What well you'd read the script, but what might a character choice be that you would make? Well, sometimes there are character choices already given you in, in in this description, right? But it depends on what kind of cop it is. If it's a beat cop, I would love to play him with bad feet. I'd love to have him like or some kind of pain or something. Just anything that's behavior, mm. anything that brings in some other behavior. You know, I auditioned for um, things to do in Denver after you're dead. Treat Williams got the role that I auditioned for. I did the audition under the chair. What? And, yeah, because the, the guy was nuts. You know, that character was nuts. So I did the whole like I'm like under the chair talking like like this. And they didn't get it. <laughs> but I did what I came to do. <laughs> you know. Have there been have there been other instances you can share with us of, of parts that you really wanted that you didn't get? Oh man, um, let's see. Because you work a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. Um, Oh, I can't. I, I honestly, I, I mean, there's stuff like like um, Ray Liotta with the, the the thing that he did with uh, with J Lo. I mean, that was a that would have been a great role for me. Um, I never got on Sopranos. I was up three times for regular roles. I was up for uh, Richie Aprile, uh, one other role, and the very last role was Stevie B. That that was that was it was. And from what I understood, mm -hmm. it was only Steve Buscemi and I. And in fact, when I wow. read the sides, Tony Soprano says to Stevie B, his cousin, he goes, oh, you look, you look like you've been working out. <laughs> and Stevie B says, well, what else are you going to do in prison, you know? Well, when Buscemi got the role, they yeah, took those yeah, lines yeah, he's right out. The link, they, yeah, he's getting They took the lines right out. But those are, those are things, you know. Although all my Italian relatives are glad that I didn't do Sopranos. Really? They just feel like, you know, it was bad. Bad for Italians. Yeah, mm -hmm. bad for Italians, you know. But either way, you know. I, I, so that that's something I, I wish I, I, I could have done, just to be part of, of that sort of history. Um, so tell us how you got Cop Rock. So um, I actually had to do more, because of my singing, <laughs> I had to do more callbacks than, than, than the other guys. Um, but what ended up happening was... So now, are you nervous that you're going to have, that you're going to go in and you're going to have like a singing audition? Did you, did you take a lesson? Did you, did you... Work with a I coach? had one of the singing. You know what? You reminded me. I had one of the singing audition for the pub. I was still at McCall's. Mm -hmm. Jeanette, uh, there was a production at the Public Theater of something called Lenny and the Heartbreakers, and so uh, I had to prepare a song. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I didn't know what to do. So Jeanette had some friends who were voice teachers in New York. So I went to this voice coach mm -hmm. and she gave me a couple exercises and I, I tried to prepare you know two songs you know uh, but I didn't know that one was you know one was called a ballad one was I, I, <laughs> a beat and one was it you know so the first song I did was she, she works hard for the money because I did something that was on the radio at the time so I didn't have to work on lyrics and everything else right. right so Jeanette said to me just 
and this was before I had studied acting. I was just doing improv, so there was really I didn't understand the audition process. She said, just, just act like you're in the bathroom, you know, singing, you know, to the mirror or something. So I went in with a button-up shirt, and I'm singing. She works hard for the money, and I'm and I um, and I do it, and I unbutton, I take my whole shirt off, right? And I, you know, and they said that was great, uh, and I said thank you, and I walk away. They go, uh, don't you want to do a ballot? I go, I don't have any more clothes to take off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't know what else to say, you know. <laughs> so I, you know, I I don't I, I was no, I didn't do the ballot. I so you didn't have a ballot prepared. I did. I don't remember what. It was. Oh, it was uh, every breath you take. It was this thing. Uh, uh, yeah, but I. I mean, you know, I couldn't. I. I was scared shitless. I really was. Um, Pete, are we having a volume problems? I saw you messing with the microphone. The I, mic dropped. Oh, are people? Can people hear? Is as anybody? As far as I know. If If you can hear, tell us because we we finally have the mic. By the way, I want to make an official apology to Pete George because for the last two weeks I've been blaming Pete that you guys couldn't hear. It's like Pete, we have a microphone. It turns Did you say out two months. I'm sorry. <laughs> two months. So, Pete, it turned out you guys weren't hearing the microphone at all. It wasn't even. It did. We didn't have the right cord, so you were just hearing the phone. It had nothing to do with Pete. Pete was brilliant. There you go. So, so we do have a comment okay. from a friend of mine that I know from 1989. We had the first, our first agent together oh. in Akron, Ohio. Vince Lozano says, he's awesome. He beat me up in a film a long time ago. So what, there you go. Does he say what film it is? He didn't say what film. Say you, have what to film tell us, you have to tell us, Vince, what Try film it is. It, it, hi, Peg, um, Sharon, Lee, who else? Do we have any other questions, Pete? Uh, we do, actually. Uh, is there anybody that you would really like to work with in a film? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people. I mean, I, I, I'd like to work with some of the old-time actors. I, I'd like to work with Robert Duvall sometime. Oh, well. Uh, yeah. You know? Um, I loved working with De Niro. That was kind of funny. And it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I'll tell you that story some other time. In, in oh, some Williams other time? In Williamsburg. <laughs> but no, it was, it was good. And, and uh, My friend Drew fact, is his partner. A, Do you know Drew? They own uh, Tribeca Grill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. One of my oldest friends. So, um, in fact, Drew, I think, is married to somebody that I worked at McCall's with. Oh, my God. Really? Yeah, he's been married to her for 40 years. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think yeah. so. Um, 40 years. So here's the story. Uh, um, uh, my first movie, basically, Goodfellas, right? Yeah. So I get in. I get in the car. What a place it's to It's 3 start. o'clock in the morning. And first of all, I get to I, I went to wardrobe calls and everything before this, months before. And then I flew back in May. And Sonny was already born and, you know, brought him back. And um, so I, I, I go into my trailer, you know, at 1 o'clock. And I don't recognize the suit that's in there, right? I put it on anyway. I get into the car and there's De Niro with the suit that I had tried on. So he must have said, the, you know, costume. I like that one. Yeah. So he goes, he goes, hey, dude, I'm Bobby De Niro. I go, I know. He goes, <laughs> so that created my De Niro face, right? So I've yeah. seen your De Niro face. <laughs> so, so things are going on. Do you we do had, the voice? Huh? Do you do I, the voice? I haven't, I haven't really tried his voice. Okay. So now they're filming the scene where they're punching me out, right? And they do the master first. So, uh, and, you know, De Niro... He lost. He hit me a couple times. He missed. You know, it was three o'clock in the morning. What are you gonna do? But so the camera's right there, and so to to sell the punches, if they're gonna stop, I'm throwing my head back like this and to the side and blah blah blah. So at that time, I was studying martial arts, and with every violent action, you release some kind of sound, right? But I didn't want to do a kiai, you know. <laughs> so action. I'm going. I go back to fifth grade. I go. Dish, dish. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> sound guy comes over. He goes, "You don't have to do that. We can put the sound in later." <laughs> you know. Oh my god, that's yeah. very funny. And the Nero's going <laughs> like this. That's very funny. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you know, it was, uh, it was that was a, a fun thing. It did was we? A, it, was it? Was that a question? Well, I can't remember. Did we come in on a question on that? Or did, no. Okay. No, um, okay. Yeah. No, but I want to know what Vince... Uh, if, is Vince, Vince still with us? I haven't, uh, he has not responded. Okay, so maybe Vince... Uh, Vince, come back and call him us. and put him on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he's your friend. Yeah. That's right, Tony D. 
David. So, okay, so so you go in for the Cop Rock audition. I don't think we finished this story. Right, so right. And, and uh, oh, so... so this you, isn't the one where you do the ballad and the... No. No. I just did the same song. And they actually brought me over to Mike Post's studio for one rehearsal before I went back in. Okay, wait. So you go in and you sing... Which song do you sing? Blue Monday. You sing Blue Monday. I sang the same one, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and... They were looking for people who were actors that could also sing, but everybody, like Larry Joshua, was he was a rock and roll singer. Mm -hmm. um, 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 Jimmy McDaniels had a training voice. And Bobby was was an Annie on mm -hmm. Broadway, I mm -hmm. think. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, everybody was pretty, Kathleen, former Kathleen, you know, yeah. amazing. Um, and and Paul McCrane, mm -hmm. in, in fame, he was, you know, he sang. Right. You know, right. fabulous. So, I mean, just amazing yeah. people, you know. And I was very intimidated. So anyway, but um, the. The cool thing was, when I got the job, mm -hmm. you know, I had just gotten out here and I wanted to try features. So this character, Vincent LaRusso, was supposed to be like four episodes and then sing a love song to your gun and blow your head off. I said, wow. what a way to go out of television, right? Wow. Well, it turns out that the network liked the character so much that they kept me on for the entire run wow. of the show. Wow. Um, so... I don't think that they thought that I was going to be there that long, that maybe I'd do one song and I was prepared you know, for that. But I ended up doing three songs. I was the last one to sing in succession, and the four, fourth episode was my first song. Uh, and then uh, one of the last episodes, and then there was one in the middle, you know, the one with the, the party, the birthday party. So, uh, um, so that audition, how nerve-wracking was that for you? You know what? It, I was at the point where I went, you don't care? I don't care. I, I, I know they loved my acting audition, mm -hmm. and I knew, and everybody said, all my managers, and, and my, or I didn't have managers at the time, I had my agents who are now my managers, mm -hmm. um, Kay Lieberman and Lenore Zerman, and uh, they said, look, they like you. You'll work for Botchko. What, was your, what like was your acting you. audition like? It was the scene from, uh, from the pilot where I'm on the, uh, on the witness stand. Where I say, you know, you don't live in Los Angeles, you live in Vietnam. This guy's been doing this, <laughs> doing that, right? And 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 the, the last line is, now I'm done. <laughs> and Judy Lowry became a, a, a great part of it. She cast it, and uh, it was it was an amazing thing, man. It was just uh, it was I'd never done summer stock or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I, I never went through that, mm -hmm. you know. But this seems to me to be how you get mm -hmm. that close mm -hmm. we were really close yeah. people would show up on their days off to see somebody else's big number oh you know yeah I mean uh, it was it was. there is something life. about when you sing there's a different you can bear your soul man yeah. you know and, and uh, especially like I said you know if, if you're not a trained singer you know you gotta kinda like find it's like that audition that I was telling you about before you have to find a character mm -hmm. to channel that particular you know technique through and uh my my technique was fear it helped me channel it right through so look it's not me singing it's the character singing you know whatever all right so we have to talk about civil wars that yeah so sexy and you and marielle just was, had chemistry out there was see, and, you know steven didn't think we did what? he says in his book we didn't have chemistry in it you know what yeah but uh and he's my mentor he's a great guy i, I love and i miss him Terrifically, and and uh, did you? I, I assume you had chemistry reads, and for that, no, because Ooh. well, I was very new to the business. Still, I mean, I was this, that was my second lead role. I mean, Botchko made a leading man on me. I came out of here in, in comedy, and all of a sudden I'm doing cop rock, and the next thing is Civil Wars. And actually, they wanted me to play a different character in Civil Wars. They wanted me to play a private detective that would recur for the law offices. Was it Alan Rosenberg? Alan Rosenberg played another the, partner. Mm -hmm. And Alan's from Patterson, New Jersey. Oh, wow. So we, we could finish each, each other's sentences. Mm -hmm. But they wanted me for this role that was going to be like a recurring role. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, after Cop Rock, I started getting offer leads from other mm -hmm. production companies. Uh, in fact, I got, I, they wanted me to do the commission. Wow. Um, so, um, and why didn't you? What because were you doing? It was, it was going to be in uh, it was going to be in Vancouver. My kids were four and two, and I didn't want to go away. Aww. So, uh, 
Um, they were really nice though, and 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 so I went back to Botchko's and I said I, I said listen I, I, these guys are all thinking about me as a lead, and you guys are offering me, can I read for the lead, you know? Wow. And he said yeah. Boston. So I read for yes. it, and I read for it with Barbara Boson, his wife at the time, and uh, and then Debbie Mazur got cast, and they couldn't find uh, the Sydney character, and. Uh, and then Greg Hobbard called me up and said, uh, we got Mario Hemingway. I went, wow. I said, that's going to be, you know, big thing for this commercial success of the show. And he went, fuck you and your marketing bullshit. <laughs> you know, you know. So, but, uh, but that was, I mean. I, was that a fun show to do? It was fun. I, 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 it was fun for me because, I mean, here's this, uh, we, we used to do interviews together and they'd say, well, you know, how's the chemistry? I said, listen, man, I said, I think chemistry's fine. I said, but you got to remember, her grandfather was a world-renowned author. Mine was a shoemaker. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge world in between there, you know. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we come together on a certain, you know, in a certain place. And I just actually found her on, on Facebook last year. We were trying to get together. We haven't gotten together. She's really happy now. She wasn't very happy then, but mm -hmm. uh, but she's really happy now. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was, it was She's great. been with the same guy for... A while now. Yeah. Her husband, her two beautiful daughters were with her first husband, who was a restaurateur. Mm -hmm. Actually, he created a, a, she had a chain of three or four restaurants called Sammy's. Mm. Um, and that's what he created. And I think he came out of the Central Cafe in New York, like Bruce mm -hmm. Willis and the rest of those mm -hmm. guys. Um, I was Maxwell's plum. That's where I met Drew. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember Maxwell's plum. Oh, yeah. So, you know, that, that was, uh, that was, yeah, it was a great, uh, it was a, a great show and it was great for me because um, nobody really looked at me as a leading man they looked at me as a, a, a tough guy you mm -hmm. know and uh, it was great I loved yeah you were the romantic lead I loved playing the law I mm -hmm. loved the law if, if I was a conscientious enough student I, I, I would have gone to law school mm -hmm. one of my best friends we were co-captain the football team at college He's a federal appeals court judge now. <laughs> from from uh, from you know he's and he was brilliant from Shemokin, Pennsylvania. You know, cold town boy. You know, and and now he's a federal appeals court judge. You know. Wow. Because All right, so I'm doing yeah. this. beating people up. Vince Lozano said it was fallen arches. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. He said it's uh it's now a Starbucks in Highland. It was a gas station. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Vince is an awesome actor as well. So. Yeah, Richard uh, Portnow was in that, and um, I forget the guy that directed it. And I met one of my best friends, Justin Lewis. Uh, he goes by Louis Ferrer now. Um, he was in that too. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Vince. Um, what about um, okay? So, Murder One. I, I was a huge Murder One fan. That was a great show. Yeah, it was great. And then, and Stephen called me and said, you know, I don't know how many more we're going to get. You want to do this last arc? And I went, sure, I'd love to do it. You know, because uh, um, La Polly and I had been uh, sort of neck and neck for a lot of roles. I can you see know? that. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot. And uh, and so I wanted to work with him again and. Uh, but he backed out of the scenes that we were in together. I think he was sick or something, and mm -hmm. the other guys did it. But that was a great show. And, and you know, again, I, I, uh, I just love, I love how the law works. I love the fact that you, that there are words that have to legislate morality and how, mm -hmm. how do you bridge those two concepts? You know, it's like when you look at debates like, like the choice and abortion debate. When you look like any any of these things. You wonder how you can write law that allows you to do one thing when you know morality tells you you cannot do that thing, you know. But yet you have to find a line mm -hmm. to explain to give everyone their freedom and give everyone their choice or their rights. You know, it's really interesting. Rights versus morality, is, and the law attacks that all the time. It doesn't always win, but it's really interesting the way they try and go about it. And you're kind of political on your. Page, uh, you know, we we haven't I been am. Facebook friends very long. I am, but I am, I am. I just, I, I uh, but you know what? I, the stuff that I post, mm -hmm. and I'll take it down if, if I'm wrong. Uh, I filter through my old research MBA. Wow. If, if, if the information, in and of itself, mm -hmm. is good information, everybody's gonna have an editorial slant, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But good objective information 
that comes from, you know, research done by Forbes or research done by, I don't care if it's CNN, if, it's, if they use the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there's no political agenda there. If they use, you know, the, the Congressional Budget Office, there's no political agenda there. Those numbers are the numbers that they are. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of stuff that I put up. And, you know, it just happens to be in favor of the political side of the aisle that I, I'm, in, I'm a registered independent, mm -hmm. but I have, you know, always felt closer to the left, you know? Um, but, but Every so, independent I know, hi mom, is really Republican, yeah. so it's unusual. Not well, me. you know, Are you I'm independent, independent uh, but I, I'm leaning logical. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing, you know, that's, that's the thing. I can see value on both sides. You know what, politics has become a, a sport there's two teams and one has to win. That's bullshit. Yeah. We're the ones that are supposed to win. Mm -hmm. Those teams shouldn't matter. But but since compromise, since the mid '90s or early 2000s, when compromise became a bad word, um, you know, it's become a team sport, and uh, and people will do anything to win. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way that's supposed to work. Yeah. And football's supposed to work that way, you know, but not politics. We have a question that ties into that more or less Okay. with having a say in the matter. Uh, Kimmy says, um, does Peter have any interest in writing or producing? I do. I've written actually a few scripts, one on my own and uh, a couple others with uh, uh, other people. I have have you ever written with Jeanette? No, she didn't want to write one. <laughs> we wrote one thing together, actually we did, based on my family nutty construction company thing. Um, but I did, I pitched actually, I pitched to... Uh, uh, Fox a couple mm -hmm. of years ago with the executive producer of 24, John Kassar, mm -hmm. and another guy, Jeff uh, King, who was running uh, White Collar. And then I pitched an, another show that I wrote um, myself uh, with Bill D'Elia, who was the executive producer of, uh, of How to Get Away with Murder now, mm -hmm. he's director, and uh, Michael Chernichin, who's an old friend I did, who's run Law and Order forever, mm -hmm. and who I did a pilot for years ago that, that never got on the air. So, yeah, I do want to write and produce. I, you know, I, I, I love the creative process. And in this genre that you tend to... The, 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 uh, the one that I pitched to Fox was uh, Customs and Border Patrol and ICE. Couldn't be more, m more pertinent now. Right. The one that Bill D'Elia fell in love with was, I don't know, I'll give it away, but it's registered, so who cares. <laughs> About these two brothers, New York City detectives, top of their game. 20 years in on the force, but their lives are unfulfilled because they want to be lounge singers. <laughs> so <laughs> they get pissed off because they can't sing the national anthem at the Yankee game <laughs> because they're lounge singers. <laughs> and uh, they quit. They take early retirement. And they go to Atlantic City. Um, and they become private detectives for this ex-dancer who has a private detective agency. And they work on the routines all day. And at the end of every show, after they do the private detective case, they're like Seinfeld used to do. They're either singing at or auditioning for some piece of shit lounge in Atlantic City <laughs> with an old standard that, you know. I love it. Oh, that's, that's and you know fabulous. what's great about it? It's Atlantic City. Mm. Nobody's done anything there for such a long mm. time except, you know, a Boardwalk Empire, but mm -hmm. not the Atlantic City that we mm. see. And it's the vortex of two cultures, the New York and the Philadelphia culture. Mm -hmm. You know, on weekends, the emergency rooms are filled with, with Eagles fans and Giants fans. You know? <laughs> You know, that's Is the, that true? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's only an hour and a half from Philly, and it's two hours, two and a half. Maybe, from, you know. Um. So, all right. So let's get current. This is us. Yeah. What a character you play on there. Yeah. That's that's. I have never seen you do a part like that that I can think of. Uh, I've done some pretty bad guys, but they mostly bad guys, outwardly. But... You know, not not emotional bastards, yeah. and, and you know, it's a, uh, um, you know. I think one of the things that we were talking about before is how, how I became an actor was watching and listening and to the stories and, and, and I found that I have a, a file cabinet in my head of everything that's ever happened to me. Every pain that I suffered from a friend, whether it was physical or emotional, whether it was big or small, or whether the action was small and the hurt was big. Mm -hmm. It's all up there. It's from from being punched out by a friend to just a turn of a head when you're telling them something important. And with a character like This Is Us, I get to use wow. all of that stuff. I wow. get to mine that stuff. I go back to where I remember, you know, 
uh, somebody's saying something to me really important. I'm looking at the TV and going, yeah, you and your mother, you know, like that. Just completely denying that person's existence. It's so horrible. You know? Do you have do you have an alcoholic role model? I mean, is there somebody that no. you kind of you don't need, you know what I don't need an alcoholic role. Mm-hmm. All I need is a role model of someone who uh, is um, is is uninterested in in mm-hmm. other people and in, in, in humanity. Mm-hmm. That's all that, that that's what alcohol does. It it you know it puts you in this other world where nothing else mm-hmm. matters, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so. You could either be a happy alcoholic, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and which nothing else matters, mm-hmm. or you can be a, a mean ass alcoholic again, which nothing else matters to you because you know you just put them off and and, uh, and put them down. And uh, but what really interesting thing they did with this character with Stanley last mm-hmm. year was when um, when they aged me down, they called it, uh, um, you know, they took back my turkey neck and <laughs> did all kinds of stuff. And what did they call it? They called it. Um, uh, oh What's that God. movie where the ki- where he goes backward, where Brad Pitt goes backwards? Oh yeah, uh, um, that was just on the other night. Button, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah Benjamin Button. Benjamin, yeah, yeah. What do they call it? They call it euthanizing when they when they take yeah yeah. Okay. So um, what do they do? They pull back my old neck and, and they tape, tape it, it and put some makeup over the back of that and uh, they they. Uh, Tighten my face up as best they could. With tape, and, they use tape. Well, you know, yeah. not here, but but back here mm-hmm. they did. Mm-hmm. And then they did a little digital photography. You know, mm-hmm. so before they did that, I took a, I took a picture and I brought it home to Jeanette and I said, so I'm supposed to put, play this guy. He's 29 or 30. Mm-hmm. And I said, uh, how old do I look in this? She goes 40. I go good because this is 1949. Everybody who was 30 looked 40. Oh, that's true. <laughs> okay, you know? It's true. Yeah. yeah. Think about it. Yeah. It is you know, true. Our parents, what they look like when they were yeah. age. Yeah, crazy. Okay, and now SWAT. So, SWAT. so, so, talk about SWAT. So you got you got the guns going on, <laughs> but you always you, guys, you have always them. have the guns going on, well, right? You you always stay fit. I always I, since I got cut from pro football, I worked out all my life. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I mean, it's one of the ways that I meditate. I I, I always said I don't think I'm smart enough to think about nothing. To meditate. Okay, now I heard you do an interview where you said, I don't meditate. I don't. But working out is my meditation. Okay. Because I don't mm-hmm. think of anything else, which right. is what you're supposed to do when you're meditating. That's right. right. And, I, and like I said, I don't think I'm smart enough to think of mm-hmm. nothing. So, I know uh, I'm not. And I tell you, the gym, I, I tell these guys that, that come up to me, you know, and I, the gym is the only place I go where my goal is to leave. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> I friggin' hate it. And everybody thinks, oh, you love gym. I don't like the gym. I like leaving. And isn't it interesting that the first thing I do in my day Mm -hmm. is something I can't stand, but it's for me. Mm. That's a great paradox to start the day out with, Mm -hmm. you know. So, so that's that's part of it. And 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 uh, you know, there's there's guys coming up to me going, uh, "Hey man, what are you doing for your biceps?" Mm -hmm. You know, and I go, "Dude, I'm old enough to be your grandfather. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you my bicep thing." But you know, they go, "How old are you?" You know, and I I tell them, they go. Oh man, I hope I look as good as you when I'm your age. And I go, and that's not the compliment you think it is. <laughs> you know, so don't I, throw that around. <laughs> I get that one too, and it's like, no, I don't look good for 63. I just say you look good. Yeah. Why do you have to do that? That's it's right. horrible. That's right. So okay, so SWAT. So t- so is this fun for you? Is this? So t- I love SWAT. I love it. It's fun. I get to, you know, whatever boys want to do when they're younger: be cowboys or be cops. You know, and shoot guns and do all that stuff. And and uh, and now you know I'm I'm on my way out, so they you know they're they're letting me go. But uh, oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah, I'm retiring. This actually this this episode this Thursday is my last episode of this season Whoa. at least. If if okay. they want to bring me back next year, they can. But virtually, I'm retiring. You know, okay. so I already gave my 30 days notice. Okay. So I'm not blowing any storylines. <laughs> you know, in another episode, but uh, but but SWAT's been wonderful, man, and mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, and the people, you know, that I met, and I got to do my own stunts. I got to do this whole big Really? Fight. You do your own stunts? Oh, I did a fight thing. Yeah, I did my own stunts. They have stuntmen there for me, mm-hmm. and they cut in between the two of us, mm-hmm. you know. But I, I Have went. you ever gotten hurt doing a stunt? No. Good. Never got hurt. Mm-hmm. No. That's because you're skilled. You're a wrestler. Well, I'm a wrestler. Yeah, yeah, you do want, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I studied karate, too, you know, so... Uh, um, but, yeah, I mean, it's a, that was that's a machine swat. It's like, you know... Every weekly explosion, you know, that's and it's great, and people love it, man. I get Twitter 
comments all the time and stuff, you know. So I, I would love to have stayed there, uh, you know, as a regular, um, but uh, you know, so I could buy my little house in Italy. So, so what, what, what is there anything that you haven't done that you'd, aside from the directing and the, I mean, the producing and the writing, is there a part? Is it? Is there a? Have, did you do theater? I don't know this about you. I, I did the last play I did, uh, George Firth. You know who George Firth is? I do know George Firth. Yeah, he wrote Company, mm -hmm. but he was also a character actor. Mm -hmm. it, it, we did a play at The Matrix. That mm -hmm. was the last, was that the last play? Or was it, I did the 30th or 40th um, uh, anniversary of Gemini mm -hmm. with Mindy Sterling. Do you know Mindy? I do know Mindy. That's where I, I was just Mindy looking at her car friends. today. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so yeah, but, but not no. I'm coming for you, Mindy. You I know that. I haven't done Broadway or anything. I got my equity card at the Public Theater. Oh wow! I was in the uh, original production of Talk Radio. Wow! I did one character on stage, uh -huh. and then I did like five callers. Um, so you do have voices. You have. I had some voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah you got some good. My voices. son Sonny's is taking over in that category. He's much better than I am. He's he's amazing. But so no. But if I if if you know, I would like to, you know. There, I got do the to, movies still call? I mean, is that still something you'd like to do? Uh, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I'd love to do a movie. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I'm dying to do movies mm -hmm. still, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I do these little independents. I did a great movie called West End, and Eric Roberts and I uh, were in Hi, Florida. Eric. I love Eric. He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. Great and fine actor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we got to play at the Jersey Shore. It's a great movie. You should find it. West what? End. Okay, I'll um, look for it. And, uh, you know, and a few other little independents. And then back when I was... You know, rolling. I did a lot of cable movies and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I would like. I got to do a. I, I got to do a great job. A friend of mine. We wrote a script together, actually. But we met on this movie. He wrote the script. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Shelter. It was uh, me and him, John Allen Nelson, and um, uh, Charles Durning was in it. Kurtwood Smith was in it. No, no, Kurtwood Smith. Kurtwood no. Smith was the father in the '70s show, and he also was one of the fathers in uh, Dead Poets Society, the mm -hmm. one whose son kills himself. Oh. He's a great actor. Mm. And so was Charles Durning. Mm. Yes. But so, so my, this, we weren't friends yet. He saw me at the gym. He said, hey, um, I'm doing this movie down in Arkansas. I got all the funding, blah, blah, blah. I'd like you to take a look at it. And I said, okay. So he dropped it off. It turns out he lived like a block away. He drops it off. And I read it, and I called him back. I said, who do I have to have sex with to get this role? <laughs> It was about a Greek mobster and a Greek family down in Arkansas who was, you know, running drugs, doing whatever they were Greek? doing. A Greek? The FBI, yeah. Okay. So I said to him, I'd like to, I'd like to do a Greek accent and speak in Greek if I could, you know. He said, okay. He was really like, no oh, shit, you know, because mm -hmm. they wrote it like these Greeks come down from New York, so I could have done just my regular right. speech. Um, so I remember the first day, the first scene, I said, look, let's... If you, you know, if you don't like it, I got no ego about this, mm -hmm. you know. I did it, and they went nuts for it. So I got to do things wow. that larger actors than me get to do. They get to do accents. They get to play maladies. I'd love to do Rain Man. I'd love to do, you know, something, you know, those are... Where you really sink your teeth. Well, yeah, because, I mean, because it's just, it's... Because the physical then drives the emotion as well, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, there's plenty of times when I remember seeing people. I remember seeing this guy on a beach one time, in, in, in New Jersey, and and you know we're all worried about how we look, and you know, and this guy was sitting there. He was so he, he had muscular dystrophy or something, mm -hmm. and he had a floppy hat on, you know, and he could. I mean, he could barely. He could barely put on his his suntan lotion, you know? Mm -hmm. And I looked at this guy and I'm like, what the hell am I worried about? What am I worried about, you know? And it was, and it was things like that, that land on people. That's it the sounds kind of like stuff you're you very, uh, I, I, I don't even know what word I'm trying to say, but you're hyper aware of what's going on around you and, um, you, t and you take everything yeah, in yeah. clearly. Yeah. Assimilate it and spit it back oh, out. I, I think good actors should be empaths. Mm -hmm. You know, I, they they should be empathetic. They, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, because that's the only way you can deliver another life besides your own. You know, you take pieces of what you've learned. You know, or seen. You know. Well, it seems to me that everything that everything that I've ever seen you do, 
you own it uh, completely and uh, are, you're never exact you, you do bring something very unique to every character that you play something very specific that makes you so real in everything that you do well I, I appreciate that and that's the thing that you know that's what I set out to do I set out to do something different from everybody else but not to the point where it hurts the production I've worked with somebody I worked with a big star one time we did a big movie and he was the hero and he played it such as such an anti-hero that he just the movie was you know a mess and it was a big budget movie mm -hmm. uh, and he's the kind of guy who if you look at his career mm -hmm. he wallows in making the opposite choice mm -hmm. that's something the actors of our generation learn to do mm -hmm. but you don't do it if, if, it, if the Cost director the doesn't movie. want it mm -hmm. if it costs you the movie mm -hmm. if it doesn't fit you know mm -hmm. you have to give that up mm -hmm. but he was such a big star you didn't have to <clears throat> you know he didn't have to give it up you know and I've seen him do it to a couple of movies. But wow. so, you know, it's always good to make choices, but that's in the process. You have to have your ego intact enough that when you go into the room or when you step on a set that the director can tell you, I don't like that, I don't like that, I like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's when I coach I do I, I, with people too. I say, So do you, you know, coach out here? Yeah, I just, I coach mostly friends, some, mm -hmm. some accomplished, really accomplished act, actors and actresses. And then, and you still do an improv group? You were saying you have yeah, a yeah. I do. I do an improv workshop with uh, with Bill, Lynn. B with Lynn and, and Billy Steinkellner uh, runs it. He's the first person that Jeanette ever did improv with mm -hmm. when she was out here in California before she came to New York. And Billy and his wife Sherry, uh, they ran Cheers uh, for a while. Um, and um, in hi, Tracy. Shows. Tracy worked. Tracy, out. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Tracy and, and, and John, John was, right? John was on Cheers mm -hmm. too, right. all through Billy. Mm -hmm. um, in Sherry. And uh, so Billy does this workshop and it's great. I get to work with all these like John and even Lorraine Newman was in the class and was in the workshop a couple of times. Yeah. I was sitting there doing an improv with Lorraine Newman. Like, wow, <laughs> I love Lorraine. Geez. Yeah. Um, so, and, and oh, so is there more comedy in your future? I mean, do, we, would you like to do a comedy? Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm dying to do a comedy. I'm dying, whatever. It takes do you get you. to do you get called in for comedy? I got. I, mean, I just had a couple auditions for pilots that were fairly comic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the one that I really wanted, uh, Andy Garcia got. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he's coming to television. So and I don't uh, think of him as funny at all. There you go. Okay. Uh, it's with Keenan Thompson. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the other one was uh, uh, pretty funny too. But uh, but yeah, I, you know, I was in the middle of all that stuff back east, and you know. Was, trying to get get funny out, sure. out of all that other stuff you know that well you know I said I said you know we're gonna unless we're here for two hours you said that ain't gonna happen you'll be sitting here alone but we could talk for another two hours <laughs> um, Peter thank you so much for doing this thanks for having me thanks for you know me. amazing that uh, it's very rare that I do one of these with somebody that I've never met before but somehow I just knew it was gonna be easy and thank thanks. you for making it so easy well, thanks Susie Sorrow for and thank you us Susie. together I'm, I'm so grateful <laughs> Susie and and all the people that we know together that that are loving on this Lynn hi Pete thanks so much for doing this Pete yes. George back there thanks, and Pete. Um, um, Next week is Coco Dolan's. Uh, you a Monkees fan? You a Monkees yeah. fan? Okay, yeah. so Coco, Mickey's sister, and she's been singing with the Monkees all those years. Oh, I didn't know that. And yeah. yeah, she sang with Mickey. She was on Circus Boy, which I didn't even realize she had. She was. Yeah, she had a, a little role on Circus Boy. Uh, uh, so yeah, we'll be back next week with uh, with Coco Dolan's. And thank I'm you so much. I'll tune in. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. Thank you. And he's hot, hot, hot. Okay, see you next week. That's the lights. <laughs>